Hi, this is episode two of the Stories of the Songs. Uh, and it's just a few minutes since I did episode one, but I want to do another one. Uh, I'm quite happy with that. Bit, bit here, there and everywhere. Uh, but that's fine. What you see is what you get. Uh, if we want to edit, then we'll do all that later. For now, it's just about talking, getting it out there, getting it uploaded and uh, seeing how it all looks and sounds. Levels seem to be okay there. You could hear me. Let's see if we could do it again, although I've temporarily got no sound. Can we hear anything? Should be doing a sound check before I start, really, shouldn't I? <coughs> Might be browser issues. Anyway, I want to crack straight on. We're only 45 seconds in, so uh, plenty of time to go. I want to crack straight on with uh, song two. Uh, and before I get on to actually talk about the song itself... Uh, I thought it might just be uh, interesting and relevant to have a bit of background behind, uh, you know, why I'm doing this and why I think it's relevant. Uh, it starts with this word paradigm, uh, which is a great word. It's often misunderstood, often misapplied, uh, and it's one of the most uh, underrated concepts in music, I think. And by the end of this video, you'll understand what I mean by a paradigm and why it's so important. Uh, I'll just look it up, just to make sure we've actually got the right definition. Uh, so a paradigm, what is it? It's basically a framework of ideas. Uh, that's my Adam definition. I'm just calling up a dictionary one. There we go. A typical example or pattern of something, a pattern or model, a set of linguistic items that form mutually exclusive choices in particular syntactic roles. Uh, wow. <laughs> so it's a typ Whoa, that works. Paradigms. What on earth has it got to do with this, you're wondering? That's too quiet. There we go. Just about right. Um, a paradigm is a model, is an example, it's a template. Uh, it's a set of ideas and assumptions, uh, maybe even words and concepts, that together form a kind of a, 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 a framework for understanding a situation, if you like. Now, in terms of music, we could talk about a musical paradigm a set of assumptions, a set of shared values uh, and patterns that everyone would hear that and, and they, would, they would go, oh yeah, I get that. So genres, they're examples of paradigms really. Uh, if I say to you, say for example, hip hop, whatever assumptions you have, whatever imagery, whatever sounds, whatever set of values that you associate with hip hop, but you'd, you'd say that's under the paradigm of hip hop. Every genre has its own, disco, uh, rock, heavy metal, country and western, grime, dubstep, drum and bass, hard house, uh, punk, <laughs> I could go on. That's what makes a genre, a genre is, is a paradigm if you like, uh, and it's a set of shared values. What, what makes a song rock and not country? Uh, you could be specific, and in fact that's kind of what we're going to be doing with these videos, is really breaking down music into what makes it what it is. Now, every now and then you get a paradigm shift where something comes along and it totally changes uh, the vocabulary of music. Sometimes a single song can do it. And indeed, that's what this uh, entry, and if you, if you can hear what we're playing now, you, you might get a, an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, not this particular song, but it's a clue. Every now and then you get something that is a paradigm shift that changes the whole vocabulary, the whole sound, the whole shared of set understandings and assumptions about what music is or what a genre is uh, and I find that songs that break or make new paradigms uh, I've, they're few and far between when they happen you, you know it and it, it's, it's it's either immediate it's like the minute it happens you know that something new has just immediately happened like an earthquake sometimes it can take time uh, and you can get a few f forerunners and you don't even maybe realise at the time that this is the start of a new paradigm because we try and apply stuff to an existing paradigm because we've not really got a new one yet. That certainly applies to this song, uh, bearing in mind that it's still, or in it, when it came out, it was filed under disco because we didn't have any new concept of what it was. Any ideas yet? Can you, you know what this song is? This is, if you don't know, it's Love's Unkind by Donna Summer. This actually comes from the same album as the song that I'm going to be talking about. And the reason I'm not going straight into that is that I want to give you some context and I want to explain where the world was at, where paradigms were at, where the paradigms of music were at before this song came along. 
And I think that context will really help you explain what it did, uh, which was to basically instantly change the paradigm of dance music or of pop music as a whole. Uh, and if probably in that context, you had to say it's one of the most important songs of the last 50 years, uh, second to none. There's very few others that have done the same. Off the top of my head, and we could talk about them later in other ways, I think you could maybe say Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, uh, maybe something by The Prodigy, if not an individual song, I think them as a band, uh, Sex Pistols, maybe Anarchy in the UK. Uh, there are certain songs, I think Jack Your Body, if you remember that, or Pump Up Volume, in the late 80s, they did something similar, Rapper's Delight of a Message. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm talking about I Feel Love, obviously. Change the Paradigm, a single song that could just totally change the framework of how we think about music. So let, let's give some background on the whole situation then. We're talking about two people. Number one, Donna Summer herself, far more than just a kind of front woman. Uh, she was really, really a driving creative force in what you're about to hear. Uh, God almighty. <laughs> uh, the reason I said God Almighty is I'm playing songs from the same album as I Feel Love and it's just unbelievable how different they are the album itself was called I Feel I Remember Yesterday it was a collaboration between Donna Summer and one of the best producers of all time Giorgio Moroder who's an Italian guy based in Munich in Germany and it put together a house band uh, on drums Keith Forsey a guy called Pete Bellotti, with also on pianos and synths and guitars. Uh, various synth programmers, because you needed a bloody degree and a lab coat to program synth in those days. They were like, seriously, they were like the IT guys of their time. You, you know, you needed to call tech support if you wanted to change the sound on the synthesizer. They'd have to put in a request. <laughs> They'd have to send out an engineer with all the right screwdrivers and cables. It, it'd be able to, like patch together enough sounds to give you something that sounded like a string or a violin. I'm joking, but not, not far from it. It was a complicated business, uh, creating electronics back in the 70s. The paradigm was such that disco was done on drums, real drums, uh, violins and string sections would give you your, your kind of trimmings. You'd have bass, you'd have guitar in there, uh, but it, it was very subservient to the beat. In terms of sonics, very warm sound, post-funk in a way. Uh, some really good uh, tight drum sounds. It always amazes me how light the snares are in disco. Uh, not crashing snares, but almost like tapping a bit of uh, like a box. That sort of sound. Um, so kind of soft dance music, I suppose. But by the end of the 70s, Things were getting a bit harder, tastes were getting harder. And I think one of the vital uh, songs in Changing Up Paradigm was I Feel Love. This album, I remember yesterday, it's kind of chronological and it's a, it's a look back at periods of music. Uh, the first song I played you, Love's Unkind, uh, kind of follows on from part one in that it was a Phil Spector tribute. Uh, we forget how important Phil Spector was, way before my time, but even though I'm not... Uh, you can remember fairly long back, I can't remember that far back. But the Phil Spector sound clearly was one of the most important sounds in, in the kind of paradigm of pop music in the early 60s, uh, making it kind of teen friendly, uh, bearing in mind that teens as a kind of cultural force didn't really exist that long before. Uh, so Love's Unkind was a heart back to that era. This sounds very Motown y, this is Back in Love Again. Uh, what else have we got on here? It's Black Lady. Um, let's have a listen. I don't know half of these album tracks. Because I think it just goes to show how dominant I Feel Love was. Uh, but no one's heard of any of the other songs on it. Uh, and this is nice enough, but it's it's very middle of the road 60s uh, sounding, even though it was done in the 70s. Uh, it's certainly not paradigm shifting. It's harking back to an older paradigm. Um, I just want to hear what Black Lady sounds like. Oh, nice bit of flange, as it were. Good old Spotify. This is sounding like early 70s funk. Bit of a kind of racial and gender uh, liberation, which is always good. 
Donna Summer being a key, uh, basically a key role model, I guess. Although apparently in the 80s she went a bit, a bit peculiar, uh, found God and stuff. Nothing wrong with that, but um, I think she made some comments that were seen as rather hurtful. Uh, anyway, that's Donna on a funky one. The reason I'm playing you these is to say that the album as a whole is a journey through time. This is sounding a bit more normal disco-y. This is more like your conventional disco sound. Take me. It's okay. It's pretty good. It's better than okay, but it's it's of its time. So if you can hear all these songs on this one album, there you go. That's more like bloody uh, Bette Midler or someone. Gladys Knight. This is the song before I feel love. So the rest of the album really gives a good idea of uh, music up to that point. Um, paradigms past and present. I can't believe that you'd sit and listen to this on the stereo. Oh. And then immediately after that, let's just get the transition. Knowing Spotify, it'll put in a uh, it'll put in an advert for something. I'm 11 minutes in and I've not even played the song yet uh, because I think the background is really important with this song and I think understanding the world in which it was born. Oh, Cheltenham <laughs> might be uh, coronavirus, but they're not stopping Chel uh, Cheltenham. Uh, okay, so we just wait for Spotify to do its thing. Play its advert. That was music in 1977, very disco-y, uh, kind of saccharine, uh, lots of strings and stuff, uh, real drums and all that. Then, into that world, suddenly comes this. And talking about shifting paradigms, did they know what they were doing at the time? This was supposed to be a glimpse into the future. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> they... Uh, They'd done all these songs about past styles, you know, doo-wop and the kind of 60s teen stuff, uh, 70s disco, 70s funk, uh, and the big ballad. And then they leave the album, and I'm just waiting for Spotify to do it, sad that, uh, with a glimpse of the future. And then we can look into why this song is so groundbreaking. Are you going to be, are you going to play ball, Spotify? Here we go. Wait for it. Just from that opening fade, very slow fade. Now immediately, suddenly, music has changed. When I say music, I mean mu all of music. With those few seconds, and I'm sorry I gave you a big build up to that. That has changed the paradigm, the entire paradigm of dance music and of pop music and of electronic music of soul, of R&B, everything's changed. Now, there were people doing electronic music around this time, uh, Kraftwerk in particular, they'd already started to do the sequence beats. There was a lot of kraut rock, which was, although it was still using real drums, they were playing around with kind of, uh, you know, effects units and electronics, particularly the minimal hypnotic uh, kind of uh, drone-like groove. But none of them did this. None of them were all electronic. Uh, I think the kick drum's a real live kick drum. I think that's Keith Forsey. So that's but the only analog sound in there. Apparently he used to just sit there on the kick drum for hours on end. Uh, sometimes he'd even play other drums, but they wouldn't record it just because he'd obviously want to be playing. He'd want the feel of it. So he'd record the whole drums, but they'd only record the kick drum. Uh, so that's the only actual drum sound. The rest of it's all done by massive great 70s synths. Uh, Giorgio Moroder obviously is the brainchild behind it musically with Donna and the team. But there are other actual synth programmers there as well. Um, it's still song based in, in a way. It's still verses and choruses. It's got chord progressions. Uh, but they're, they're stripped down. It's, it's very interesting how they've done that. It sounds more hypnotic than it actually is, if that makes sense. It's still 
what chord sequence is. Here we go, we're up now. Um, but they're long, there's a long gap between changes. Uh, it's not driven by, the, it's not, how can I explain it? It's not like you've got a song structure and this is having to fit into that. It's almost like this is shaping the structure of the song. Uh, it's really hard to put into words because it's music, but this is why it's paradigm shifting. The electronics are driving everything here, uh, but it's still sexy. It's still got the human voice angle. It's not clinical. It's not soulless. It's got soul. Uh, her voice and the way it's produced, it's funky still. Um, you've got this sort of phasing. It's panning left and right. The actual analog sound of that bass is just so warm. Thudding. You've got lots of different fades going on. Um, this is really, really, really ahead of its time. Just the kick drum and the bass together. And this is the roots of modern music. Uh, basically, not being scared to just have a kick drum and a bass. Bringing in the snare, if you can call it a snare. The hats. Again, I think that was some that was done on a keyboard, uh, not even a drum machine. It was like just a sort of sound that sounded a bit like a hat. <laughs> Lots of filtering going on there. So you can really hear the roots of, sort of the next 20, 30, 40 years of music in this one song. Um, a long extended pack, um, section now, uh, with all on the one chord. <laughs> Voice comes back in again. Uh, there's all sorts of extended mixes of this. It's a really good Patrick Howley mix, which adds loads more in the, the kind of instrumental bits. But you can't really go wrong if you stick with the original um, groundbreaking song, paradigm shifting song. Best, almost the best thing, probably one of the best things Giorgio Moroda has done. Uh, he's not really done that much to equal this. He's done a few, and I'll probably do some videos on some of them. Uh, the stuff with Sparks, I think this is almost, or pretty much as good as this, in a different way. Uh, but he's also done some stuff that's pretty meh as well, so... <laughs> uh, this was definitely pretty much his career high point. This is one that had the cultural impact, I think. Uh, very, very kind of multiracial in a way, and it, it really does bridge traditionally. I hate to, I hate to talk about colour of skin when it comes to music, because music's just sound waves, but you know culture is, is a big part of music so things that had been traditionally filed under black music like R&B and soul even like the origins of disco uh, mixed with stuff that had originally been filed under kind of Caucasian white European music like the electronica this this just totally sees no colour this song this is everything all at once uh, and that's what it's just so resonant I think I think that's probably the, the song's biggest biggest impact is it really did just break down racial barriers in terms of music and it didn't need to talk about race once it's actions rather than you know a polemic it just did it it just featured a really good black singer and a really good white producer just making great forward thinking music and everyone loves it I, you don't meet anyone who doesn't like I Feel Love I mean I've never met anyone who doesn't like it and if you don't then you know feel free to comment I'm sure if you've got a good critical a reason for not liking it fair play to you uh there might be things wrong with it but i can't think of anything so i'll leave it there i'm i'm almost 20 minutes in uh absolutely groundbreaking song paradigm shifting song uh really really stunning meeting of minds there uh and yeah one of the most important songs of the last 50 years bar none really uh, i feel love thank you very much everyone and I look forward to number three let me know what you think particularly for whatever reason you don't like this song I'd love to know why, but I, I reckon we'll be waiting a long time to find anyone who doesn't like it. See you later, guys. Bye.